Hi, everybody. Before we get to another great interview, we could really use your help. IMDB, which is the entertainment database, recently named the Two Opinionated Podcast one of its top 100 podcasts. This is a monumental feat for this program. You know, we're a father and son team out of a small town in West Virginia, have been doing this for about five years. There's 15 million podcasts out there. About 40,000 of those get to the point that they're listed on IMDb. Out of those 40,000 out of the 15 million, we are ranked number 82, something that we're just immensely proud of. We're so thankful for our listeners, our watchers, our fans. Thank you so, so much. If you would like to help us out and we're asking for it, please, um, it's easy. It's real. It, it's really easy. It's free. If you go to IMDB, that's IMDB.com, look up Two Opinionated Podcast, and just take a look at the page. That's all you have to do. I mean, you're welcome to look at the cast, look at the episodes, so you can kind of see who's been on the program. Do whatever you want, but even just bringing up the page, IMDB.com, Two Opinionated Podcast, bring up the page, look at it, that helps us so much so please if you can do anything we would really appreciate that um our youtube channel is meistercon pod love to have your subscription there it's also free and you can also check out our website meistercon.com where you'll find almost 700 episodes audio and video available on there there's also a terrific blog from brett and it'll let you know anything that we have going on in studio, if we're covering a convention, if we're going on location, anything that we have going on will be on the website, MeisterCon.com. Thank you guys so, so much. We appreciate you so much. I, I can't express enough how appreciative we are of all of you. We never, never expected to, to do as well as, as we have, and that's all because of you. Thank you so much. Enjoy that interview. Bye, everybody. Hi, everybody. Welcome to another edition of Two Opinionated. I'm so excited today. I've got singer, songwriter, author, Catherine Harrison. So welcome, Catherine. Thank you, Michael. It's so good to be here. <laughs> I'm so happy to uh, talk to you. You're you're a very talented singer. I, I love your voice. And, and we've been, my, my wife is in New Orleans this week, but over the weekend, when I was prepping for this interview, we listened to a lot of your music and it you just you've got a very just pleasant voice. It's just very relaxing to listen to. It's just uh it's just great. Like we were working outside all day Saturday and we just had your music playing as we were working. Oh. It was great. Oh, thank you for that. I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah, of course. So let's let's start this way. You know, tell me a little bit about about you, how you got into uh to music, you know, when when did that start? Have you done anything, you know, besides music? I know you've written uh, uh, some in the in the past. So just kind of explain and talk a little bit about yourself. Okay. Well, we can try to like <laughs> nothing like an open ended <laughs> question. <laughs> so, you know, so if I if I go right back to the beginning, I mean, I was raised by young parents. Yeah. And, and, and that me and, and my dad especially was really into music. And so imagine, you know, a young early 20 something dad who's really into music. I mean, music was around a lot, you know, and, and he played guitar and he jammed yeah. with his friends and we had a lot of records playing and um, a real cross section of records uh, from anything from classic old blues, like Muddy Waters and yeah. um, Howlin' Wolf to of course, like, Buddy Holly and the Beach Boys and Elvis and the Beatles and the Stones and Zeppelin and Creedence Clearwater Revival, R&B, <laughs> Miles Davis, you know, and then of course- well, At least it got you all the good ones. I got all the good ones. <laughs> and and so, you know, people often ask like, what are your influences? And I, and I said, honestly, it runs the gamut. Yeah. Uh, I, other than Screamo, I, I still haven't quite connected to the, the Screamo rage filled thing that's, but, Honestly, everything you have to be angry for that one. <laughs> oh, I can be angry. I just I don't I don't know. Maybe I just don't connect to that that uh, manifestation of it. Yeah. Um, but really, at, at the roots of 
of all the music that I just cited and all the current music, even it goes back to basic blues and country, you know, yeah. like rock and roll is blues and country. It is. Right. And, and, yeah. and so singer songwriters, how, and, you know, have, have always all those songs, all those covers that cover bands do, they were original songs at one point. Right. And people took a story and they put it to some standard sort of blues or country thing. And then things have iterated, but but at its core, it's pretty much that. So I, I grew up, you know, very much immersed in it. Um, I took less than a year of piano lessons when I think I was nine. Uh, <laughs> was was that like, did you choose to stop or or were you they like, OK, this isn't working. We're going to get you. No, out. I think I, I honestly I think it was something that I asked to be able to do. Yeah. Um, I, I, interestingly, I didn't express interest in playing the guitar until I was in my teens. Uh, I must have asked to play the piano and I got lessons. And then I was like, this is kind of boring because I had to learn all the boring songs. That's right. And I'm like, this is not my jam. Like, I want to play the songs I want to play, right? Yeah. So I, I picked up the guitar, I think, for the first time when I was around 13 and learned some basic chords and uh, a few songs. But I was really into sports, you know, in, in high school and, and hanging with my friends. And, and again, it... It, music was very much a part of my life, but not as a musician. And right. I didn't really um, start playing in in earnest or writing my own songs till my early twenties. Like that's I was a late. late bloomer. Yeah, yeah, totally. that's kind of late because most most uh, songwriters, I think, start pretty early, even if it's not actually writing songs. You know, a lot of them start with uh, poetry and then move into song. Exactly. So so yeah, that's how I kind of got started. And then once I once I sort of got a guitar and um you know a, as a somewhat lazy person i mean i don't mean in general but i found it easier to write songs than to learn songs right you know like like so i just started you know playing chords that i liked and and singing over it and making stuff up and i found that i i i kind of found my inner storyteller and that's what i really think of myself now like less of a singer songwriter and more of a storyteller that I love that, that that I'm fascinated with the human experience, my, my own included. Uh, and I, and I like narrative. I like story. And for me, telling story through music is just a very natural thing that I love to do and that I love to consume as well. Well, you know, if you go back in history, we, that's kind of how we used to learn was through song. Exactly. You know, exactly. and kind of retelling the histories that way. So that kind of makes sense. Yeah. And, and right then we go right back to what we were just talking about, like at the at its roots, like Americana and country and blues. It's all just storytelling and experience sharing in, in pretty, you know, accessible ways. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love that. I, I think that's true. My, uh, my stepson's a musician and I think he would would love that. You know, and he's the, uh, he's a young dad. He's got, uh, let's see, he's 24 and he's got uh, two little ones. And he, and that's what he does. He's just constantly playing an instrument or singing or whatever. So they're just surrounded by, by music all the time. And it's a great way to grow up. Yeah. Yeah. That's super cool. It's, yeah. It's actually, my favorite, one of my favorite pictures, there's a couple, but is when I'm, I'm, you know, under two years old standing, but, but barely. And my dad is playing guitar and I'm reaching up and like touching the strings, you know, that's great. And, and that's, those are like my earliest memories. Well, it, it helps you connect. Yeah. You know, whether you're actually playing it or just listening together, I mean, music, it, it kind of brings people together and it, music is great too, because it can bring you back to a moment in time just instantly. As soon as you hear a chord. Totally. Totally. Yeah. yeah it's such an amazing, it really is a universal connector you know, uh, of everything. And, and I know pe many people have said this, but we, we often don't think about how much music is part of our world until we right. think about it. Like imagine going to a bar, no music. Imagine going to a wedding, no music. Imagine watching a movie, no soundtrack. Like yeah. imagine being on a road trip, no music. Like just when you actually start to figure out all the places that music shows up that actually becomes so meaningful for us, yeah. It's very difficult to not see its like vital nature in our lives. Yeah, 
Yeah, I, I agree. I completely agree with that. My uh, my wife works for Live Nation and has. Oh, is that right? Oh, interesting. Yeah, she's been there for twenty five years. So she's wow. so so we're just surrounded by music all the time. So if it wasn't there, there'd definitely be a hole. <laughs> <laughs> You'd have to talk to each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Nobody wants that. <laughs> Nobody needs that in their lives, Michael. <laughs> you know, when it, when I started this podcast, I tried to get my parents to watch. And and the answer I got was, well, we talk to you every day. <laughs> like, why do we need to watch? We've, we, we've heard everything you've got to say. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so so you've got a, well, let me ask you this first, before we talk about the, the new music. Um, did the songwriting lead to you writing books or had you always written? Um, so I just wrote my first book uh, four or five years ago. I launched it um, in 2020. Like the pandemic yeah. kind of gave me some space as it gave for many of us. You, you mean uh, you actually used your time wisely? <laughs> I, I did. Yes, I did. Um, I had always written. I had been, I've been a journal writer my entire life. Yeah. And writing in my journal, usually in the morning, um, but anytime I had to work out something, uh, I, I would go to my journal, I would go to a piece of paper. And if I would go on trips, I would, I would always be sort of writing a log of what I did and who I met and interesting insights that I had. And so, so it's hard to parse out, you know, one from the other, Right. but I, I hadn't, and I had thought about writing a book for many years, but again, I was like, I'm busy doing other stuff. Like that seems like a lot of work and whatever, <laughs> but I had been writing bit, you know, like essays, let's say personal yeah. essays or musings on various topics. And then, then, as I said, when the pandemic happened and my, my work schedule, which was primarily going to be out of the country in New York and in Italy, which were two of the epicenters of the COVID pandemic. Yep. I was like, wow, my calendar just got cleared immediately. Yeah. And hmm, maybe I should just see if I can put these things together. And, and you know, honestly, I was going to just Jerry Maguire it, like put them all together, go down to the store, print them off in a binder and go, hey, anybody <laughs> want to buy my book? And then, and then I ended up um, meeting somebody at a publishing house and it just, you know, we, we did it the, the regular way. <laughs> but, so, so it, but it's hard to parse out because I think, writing in any form is cool right you know and and uh well it's and definitely think, beneficial even if nobody else is reading it just yes. just kind of putting your thoughts on paper and then you can refer to them later and stuff it it's very helpful i think yeah and and, and we do this a lot and when we're um you know talking about uh good mental health hygiene too is when we are stuck in a loop or a rumination on something that we're worried about we have to get it out of our heads and onto the page. And until we do right. that, first of all, we can't just like stop the dynamic spiral. But often when we get it on the page and we can take a, we can just take a, a step back from it and look at it more objectively, it does help us just reframe it in a way that is often really helpful. And so for me, journaling is that, uh, writing music is that, writing the book was that too. You know, it's an autobiographical uh, book. So um I write things that I'm interested in hearing, you know? Right. And so, so uh, art is very subjective and not everybody might dig it. Uh, but I have to put out there what is like most representative of the kind of thing that I also like to consume. Yeah. That makes sense to me. When, when did your um, interest in mental health start? Uh, you know, it's hard to say exactly. Um, if I, if I go back to, um, I think I've always been very curious by nature uh, yeah. about the human condition and, and, and the human condition often representative, you know, represented by, you know, our, our way of seeing the world and our way mm -hmm. of experiencing events. And that, that's, you can't take mental health out of that, like our emotions and our psychological perceptions and our and the way we interact with human beings right because humans don't live in a vacuum we live in relation to other people that's right whether, whether it's a family <laughs> or a community or a nation or you know whatever and so I think of all I was always really curious in that um I have by nature kind of an anxious temperament 
so I can be a real worrier, you know, and, <laughs> and, and anxiety really is about worrying about the future, right? Like, what about this? Yeah. And what about this? And what about this? And what about it? And, and that tends to be me as sort of an analytical uh, person. So I, even in my twenties was very interested in, in finding ways like building a toolkit to mitigate some of that rumination, which I think most people can relate to. Um, and then, you know, having gone through several tragedies in my life too, and, and being very fortunate to have found an amazing um, psychologist to do yeah. a counseling with over the decades, you know, uh, that was very helpful too in, in being able to learn how to, to reframe even tragedy and the way we um, engage in life's ups and downs. And so that's always been really interesting. And then, and then I just, you know, when the, when, when, um, as a musician, I started getting involved in being a mental health advocate in the music industry. Right. And, and then, um, a couple of years ago, I decided to, uh, pivot my consulting business because I, I haven't been, um, a, a full-time musician ever in my whole life. I've always been in the business world. Right. And I decided to go back to school and get a master's in psychology so that I could actually, like know what I'm talking about. <laughs> you know, like, I have opinions for sure, but I wanted to make sure that I, that I, if I, if I really wanted to step into that advocacy work and I really wanted to be able to put forth some meaningful change, I had to know what I was talking about. Yeah. And that makes, that makes perfect sense. I, I wanted to ask you about um, the uh, appreciative inquiry coaching method. Yeah. Cause I, I come from, um, call centers that's I spent most of my career working uh in call centers and so we you know every call center you go to has their own coaching you know so you learn in different methods but I was just curious what what is that method so appreciative inquiry is it's exactly what it says which mm -hmm. is <clears throat> you know and, and I think it's interesting to talk about here Michael like the different ways people interpret the word coach because right. a lot of people think of coaching as someone who's an expert who's going to tell you what to do, make your life better. Right? That's right. Whereas some people my... think it's a negative, though. <laughs> right. Right. Oh, I need coaching. That means I'm doing something wrong. <laughs> right. And and so appreciative inquiry that that methodology is really about holding space um, and being a thought partner with the other person. So instead of me sharing with you, oh well, Mike, you know this is what I think we should do, and here's my advice. It's more about me. Uh, with appreciation and non-judgment, asking you questions, that's the inquiry part and the yeah. curiosity to help to catalyze in your own mind, like, whoa, I never really thought about it that way. And to then go a little bit deeper. And so it's really about, it's, it's really about unlocking your own insights, right? Yeah. And, and through those insights, often there are some significant revelations. And, and only then when the individual says, whoa, I think this might be the issue. Then again, we would ask questions and say, how might you get that? What might be the first step? So yeah. it's, it's really about holding space and, and, and being really curious and, and kind of being an investigative journalist, you know? Um, so then what might happen, Mike? You know, what might happen? <laughs> you know I, I suspected that's, that's kind of the, the, the method that, that was. That's, that's very similar to to what I've always used uh, with coaching, and and I've never named it, but it's it's the um, let's say if you're getting off a call, let's say, hey, what do you think went well with that call? Yeah, you know, you tell me what you think, went, and and then whatever the answer is, and sometimes people have trouble finding the positive, so you have to kind of guide them a little bit, but then it's a uh, you know, oh, I agree with that. You did that so well. You know, I also thought you did this well, and maybe that leads them to a conversation. But eventually, you know, you get to the, if you could do it again, what would you do differently? Yeah. Not what you did wrong, just what would you do differently? And then it kind of leads to that discussion. And it's, you know, you're kind of leading them down a path, but they're figuring it out. Right. With and, that. And so I, th I think those are kind of similar to it. They're to totally similar. I just never named it anything. They're totally similar. And, you know, that's the thing. Um, Actually, this is what my book is about, is that 
like most things are the same as other things. <laughs> like, right. like if you look at a sales <laughs> model or a coaching model or even a leadership model, in most cases, like pick one of a hundred at, at the root of it all, they're the same. That's right. They might be called different. They might have a different flavor. Yeah, or slightly, flavor. you know, slightly differences. But yeah, you're <laughs> right. Most most things are exactly the same. Yeah. And, and the reason that that approach works, whatever you call it, is that we do know that that human beings like to have a sense of autonomy and agency in what they do, yeah. right? Even when you think about a toddler, right? Like they, people want to feel that they have a say in what happens. So when, when, when all, when, when you're looking for someone to just tell you what to do, there's a sense of maybe even not articulated or conscious helplessness, but it's kind of like, yeah, sure. Okay. Whatever. But when someone actually comes up with their own ideas, yeah of what the issue is and how they might move forward and make some commitment to moving forward, that actually helps to uh, amplify and activate a sense of like self-determination, right? And that makes us all feel better when we have that, that sense of agency. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and and you're exactly right. I uh, One of the, the, the reasons I, I like that method is if you're in a situation where you're using it uh, multiple times on the same person, they get used to it. Yeah. So, so you have to talk less and less each time you meet and, and they just kind of go right into to figuring it out. And you're just more of a sounding board at that point. I always enjoyed that. You know, you, you have to kind of establish the procedure. But once you do, they do 90 percent of the talking. You're just kind of, you know, there to to reiterate or to agree with them. That's right. Yeah. In fact, that's funny that you say that two things come to mind. One is when I'm working with leaders who are trying to develop their own coaching. Mm -hmm. That's the number one thing I say is who's doing all the talking. And, yeah. and, and if it's not the other person, <laughs> you yeah. gotta zip it, you know? Um, that's a, that's a, like a, uh, uh, someone that's early in their management journey. They have to learn that. Yeah. Cause you know, you're, when you're brand new to, to a leadership role, you, you just want to tell people, well, this is, this is what I did. This worked for me. So you just want to, you're doing most of the talking. And as you get experience, you learn it's much more effective if, if the person you're coaching is actually figuring it out themselves and you're just there to kind of guide. Yeah. And that's the, that's the hard transition, right? Because people usually get promoted to being a leader because they're good at doing stuff. Right. And then they have to stop doing stuff and get results through other people. And that's a, that's a, that's where we get micromanagers. Yeah. But it's like, it's, well, just you, quick, it's just quicker if I tell you what to do. Yeah, that's right. That's right. And, and there's, there's a difference in being a good performer in a task and being a good leader. And a lot of people can't make that transition, but we tend to just as a society, we tend to promote people until they can't do the job. That's right. <laughs> At that's some right. point you get promoted to the point that you, it's it's beyond you, yeah. You know, for most people, for most yeah. people, and we we just that's just kind of the way we do things. And you end up with people in leadership positions that maybe that's not right for them. Maybe they were the best the job that they did was the one that they were doing. Yeah. You know, so so you might have I, I bring it up because you you may have to find other ways to reward or to motivate uh, without necessarily putting somebody in a position where they might fail. You may end up losing a good worker because they failed at whatever position they've moved into. And I think too, what, one of the issues with our society, which I will say is directly um, related to mental health, Michael, is that let's say you have that situation where you've moved up to the career and you're at that leadership place and you're like, I don't really like this. Like I liked the doing of those things and I've reached that capacity of capability. And the, the issue is that there's kind of a, there would be a social stigma to saying, I want to go back. Right. <laughs> there's a social stigma to it. So we, we don't, we don't even afford people kind of the, the right and the freedom to say, you know what, I liked it better. Uh, you know, a job or two ago. And that's what I'm going to do. People would lose their minds. Well, you think about that. If you were promoted and then you came back and said, you know, I, I actually really like what I was doing better. It, you would be looked at negatively. Yeah. Yeah. And that's kind of a shame because it should be about finding the right people for the right job. Yeah. But it's and, not most of the time. 
Right. And that, that's one of the, so that's one of the areas of focus that, that we work on is mental health in the workplace. Mm -hmm. And think about that, those people who are in that exact scenario, well, they're not going to have optimal mental health when they feel quite frankly, trapped doing a job yeah. that they don't want to be doing. Right. And they've maybe gone to the, the decision makers to say, to be honest, I, I kind of want to do that job and they won't let them. Well, that's not going to set them up for success. And not only that, the business isn't then going to get the best bang for their buck out of Michael because right. he's already said, I don't like this job as much as the other. Yeah. Job. Well, and, and we know if you don't like a job, you're probably not doing your best job. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's, that's a failing. I think a lot of companies yeah. may, you have to find the right people for the right position. And sometimes it's not the people that think they're the right people. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and that, that leads, that, then you got to go back to the coaching and kind of, you know, yeah. work through that with them but it, yeah it's that's fascinating i i thought we'd have a decent conversation because i saw you uh, uh done some work with that and i've always found it kind of fascinating that mental side of doing um a job just daily over and over because it's such a grind it can be you know i think one of the opportunities for leaders uh and i mean leaders as in like frontline supervisor all the way to right. ceo so anyone who is uh who has the mandate to uh, get work done through others, right? And to be advocates for those people. The opportunity for any leader is to provide an environment where the individual who comes to work feels seen and heard and respected for the work that they do. And even if it is that sort of grind, that they, they, have, they have a sense though, that the work that they're doing is part of something important Yes. Um, and that, that their sense of agency and autonomy is respected and that the, it's a safe place to be able to say, uh, that was a mistake, or I think that might be an issue. There's a safe, it's safe enough to say, I'd like that promotion. It's safe enough to say, I don't really want that promotion, you right. know, all of those things. And, you know, my experience in the corporate world, my experience in consulting in this space, and certainly the research shows that in many, if not most cases, we just don't have those kind of honest conversations. Right. You know? Right. Cause we're afraid to, Yeah. you know, that's, you, you don't want a negative reaction or, or maybe something that puts your job in danger. So you just kind of keep all that inside. It's not real healthy. That causes right. a lot of stress and burnout. Exactly. And, and it's, and it's not good for the business either. Mm -hmm. So what we, what, what we, we think, you know, we're, we're we think we're protecting the business and we think that we're just by focusing just on the bottom line and by focusing just on the strategy and results and not worrying about all this like you know touchy feely stuff that that we're protecting the business when in that discomfort is the opportunity to actually you know get some really meaningful um mindset shifts happening right. that that can really you know like galvanize a, a group of people a community within an organization um and, and that, that's what I think is, is that that's deeply tied to the mental health crisis right now is people do not feel a sense of agency at work, even if they really like their job per se, and even if they like their boss, there's a sense that it is a bit, you know, hamster wheel, and I'm just doing a bunch of work and I'm not really sure what the point is. And there's just some bad habits that I think. Right the workplace has cultivated and just continues to put gas on that fire. <laughs> and then, and then, you know, we can't also, we can't forget that we all just went through a global pandemic, regardless of your, you know, thinking your political views or whatever, we all just went through an experience yeah. that was really destabilizing. Yeah. For, you know, so well, we hadn't people. been through it in a hundred years and it's not exactly. like anybody knew how to handle it. Right. Right. And so, and then, and then that really turned the workplace on its head. It right. Did. So, so I just think, you know, and it goes back to appreciative inquiry, which is even in, in the conversations in workplaces, do they take the time to ask these kind of questions and go, Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I wonder how that does affect the mindset of people coming to work. I wonder if our, the way we're working here, or our policies are actually in line with the modern reality or right. what people are saying or different generations, you know, like we have a whole new cohort of young professionals joining the workforce 
and they don't know a world without the internet in your pocket. Right. They don't know a world where hybrid work isn't the thing, you know, and I, or, or that there's a 24 hour news cycle, et cetera. And I just think as, as leaders and as people with, with not just the power, but the responsibility to think about, you know, the workplace as such a vital part of society, we just have to like take a pause sometimes and ask the, the questions and engage in conversation. Yeah. I love that. I love that. We'd definitely all be better off yeah. if we, if we would, operate that way you'd have a lot happier people too because most of us you know we just want to know that we're needed whatever the job is just that it's important it's it's useful that's what we just want to be useful yeah there's a great there's a great uh story or metaphor or parable or whatever you call it i don't know <laughs> uh, right about that um which is imagine that you have a ferrari factory and in in one part of the factory you have people making tires and they come to work and they go in a door and they don't even know that they're contributing to a Ferrari. All they do is they come in and they make tires and they go out at the end of every day and they just go, I made tires, right? Compared to someone who walks in the door with all the Ferraris there and they, they know that when they get to their tire, they're making a tire that is integral to the Ferrari. Right. That, that is a completely different mindset of like, I'm making tires. But without my tires, there's no Ferrari. That's right. You know, and it's that kind of context that if we can, if we can create that sense of meaning for people in the workplace, uh, something as simple as that can be as profound as that too. Yeah. Well, and a lot of, uh, and I'll say this, and then we we can move on. But it it um, a lot of managers make the mistake of thinking that management is more important than your frontline workers. Yeah. When the reality is, if you don't have your frontline workers, it doesn't matter how much management you have. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and that that seems to be a, a really hard uh, reality for businesses to grasp because we yeah. see every day businesses behaving badly. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And, and doing the opposite of what you just said. <laughs> yeah. So okay, so you you put out some new music last month, yes, yes. right? So I think the song was uh, "Love Is Not a Game." Yep. Yeah, we really enjoyed that listening to it this weekend. But but talk a little bit about it. What's uh, what's the song about? And you know, talk about the process of writing it. So the the process of writing it was uh, several years ago. I was going through a, a breakup, and and you know, as I said earlier, writing and music is always part of my, you know, processing whatever yeah. life experience I'm having. Um, and so it was that, and then and then again, then we had a pandemic and all these other things, and so I would play it, you know, at at, at a live show, or I would just play it. And the more I played it, it it seemed to kind of detach itself from that situation right. and become more representative of love itself and and love in terms of you know we have kind of like mental health we have a very narrow definition of love which is usually love means a romantic couple right. situation right? right and and we don't think of love as you know love of our of ourselves love mm -hmm. of our families our communities our pets our passions you know love of our vocations maybe right um we don't we don't we just we have such a very narrow focus and 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 it, it we're, we're of, very like we're very against saying that we love anything yeah <laughs> it's like we try real hard not to say that right yeah. and why it's, <laughs> it's 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 that's the part we've become really disconnected to to from what it actually means, what lo what love is in a more like profound way. And so, you know, the notion of love is not a game means kind of like take back ownership of love as 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 a as an energy, as a power source for you to 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 treat yourself well, to treat yeah. others well, to really be in the moment, to engage in your passions or your vocations. To, to not get too judgy about other people and how they choose to love, because again, like not my business. Right. You know? um, and, and I think too, you know, we, we dropped it, uh, we launched it around Valentine's day. Cause we thought, well, this is a perfect uh, 
sort of, you know, alignment because Valentine's Day is all about this like romantic love and That's superficial right. love, which is, and by the way, he or she doesn't love you if they don't buy you this and do this in the in the very commercial. <laughs> very commercial. And so that just seemed to, to be that, you know, that narrative. And so so it it the song really became more about about reconnecting to that sense of like you know what love is a pretty powerful force yeah. when we remove ourselves from the sort of just very narrow and superficial uh, aspect and 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 there's a perfect alignment made with mental health too because one of the issues with mental health right now is that there's a really narrow definition there's a there's a, a narrow understanding of mental health as either you're fine and just pull up your socks or you're mentally ill right. you know, with, with, a, with a disorder and a disease, instead of saying, we all actually have a continuum of health, including mental health. Mm -hmm. We have all had ups and downs, some of us more than others. Some of us have good mental health, even though we might have a diagnosis. Others have terrible mental health without a diagnosis. Right. So it's, so, you know, like all of a sudden, these two sort of big topics, I just started to see the parallels in, in, in terms of how they go together. And, you know, one of the root issues of negative mental health is, is, a, is a sense of uh, being disconnected and a sense of not having love yeah. for yourself or not feeling seen or heard or there's no sense of belonging. And, and yeah, so those two things just became really deeply woven. And then we just decided to have fun with it and, you know, make kind of a rocking video. It was really fun to do that. It, it is a good video. Thanks. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. It and really the song's ter terrific. I, I love that kind of philosophy on love because we'd all be better off if we just let people know, yeah. you know, as, as I've gotten older, I'm much freer say, saying that I love something because I want people to know that, you know, if I care for somebody, a friend, family member, whoever it is, I want them to know, hey, I love you. That doesn't mean that I'm uh, want to be romantic with you, but I care about you. This is, you know, this is something that uh, that that you do that I love. Whatever it is, it and also I think we be go, go ahead. I was just gonna say it also doesn't mean if I love you. It also doesn't mean I like everything that you do all right. the time, <laughs> right? I think that's also part of our superficial nature. Is either I either love you or I don't love you, right? And and you know what? It's a slippery slope. So pay attention. Whereas you can it, like really loving someone is recognizing or loving anything is recognizing. It's not a hundred percent perfect all the time. Right. Well, we do that with our kids. Yeah. We just don't expand it out usually with that, but you do that with your kids. They mess up. It doesn't change how you feel about them. That's right. That's right. Yeah. And, and that's part of like, that's a mindset shift that I think can apply. Even when we think back to the, the workplace conversation and I think there's also this, well, there's a social pressure right now to have everything all at once, especially on young people, right? There's this right. pressure of like, I don't have enough. I haven't accomplished enough. Like, I'm not, because, you know, I should be a 19 year old YouTube sensation making $65 million, like, you know, from my, ba my parents' basement. Yeah. Um, so, so there's a sense of like, not enough, not enough, not enough. And I think, you know, even thinking about the workplace, you might have a bad day and you might have a series of bad days, but part of having a mental health toolkit is to say, what do I like about this situation? Like, what am I grateful for in this situation? Even though I might not like this, this, and this, um, what does it bring to my life? Like, does it help to right now? It might not be the best job, but you know what? The good thing is, is I have a home and, and I, you know, put food on the table and actually, the people at work I really like, and I'm actually learning a lot of skills. And, you know, it, it, it helps to just open up our, our mind a little bit yes. um, and, and, and be less binary, right. Which is like, it's either, either I have to love my job every day or I have to quit my job and find another job. Right. That's exactly right. It, yeah. It's the same. Yeah. And it doesn't need to be. No. Yeah. No, no that's, we're, that's... we're kind of swimming in it. Like we're swimming in this, you know, media, social media, this, you know, this, this uh, incessant message 
that that whatever you're doing isn't enough. Right. It's not as perfect as it should be. And that's one of the biggest contributors to suboptimal mental health. I know it screws up so much. Yeah. You know, enjoy whatever it is you're doing, you know, and, and see the positives in it. It may not be perfect. You know, maybe it's not even exactly where you're trying to get to, but but enjoy at least the, the parts of it that are going well. You know, and we don't even do that. Yeah. <laughs> we yeah. tend to frame it as, well, it's okay, but, you know, and whatever the negative is, when we should just be saying, yeah, this part of it is going really well. Not quite where I want to be yet, but this is going great. So we're moving forward. Yeah. And, and also to recognize, even in the really hard times, to acknowledge the like the normal nature of being a human and having hard times like yeah. that's that's this other fallacy that we live in that the human experience is supposed to be this perfect sunset experience our entire lives and this is not true you know like so so that's a, that's something to cultivate too We're hard times sometimes you're like you know right now this this sucks yeah and, uh, <laughs> you know i think i need to get better sleep i need to lie down yeah, and I make some to, adjustments. Like, I need to maybe dance to my favorite record. You know, maybe I, I maybe I'm really so bummed out because I, all I do is this thing that's like not great right now, and I've completely ignored all the things that do bring yes. me joy, like playing with my dog or listening to my record or, you know, whatever. And and I, I think that's that's part of this conversation, which is we all need to recognize the human experience is not supposed to be. A per like you know eighty five years of perfect days, right? It's just not. It's just not even realistic, you know. Yeah. Yeah. So, you, we rarely get a perfect day. Yeah. We get some good in every day, but there's usually some bad that goes along with it, you know. And occasionally, maybe you have a really good day. We definitely want to celebrate those, but you need to celebrate all the moments that are good. Yeah, and I think that's where you know social media can be really challenging because if that's something that you consume a lot, all you see are the good parts of anyone's day. That's right. You don't right. see the whole day. Yeah. And so you have this impression that another person's life or most people's lives are just vastly better than yours. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I, I it, it, you can, like just speaking as a parent and a grandparent, you can see the effect it has on the younger generation because they do, they get a lot of their positive feelings, their self-worth. And a lot of that's coming from social media and that's not necessarily a, a good thing yeah. because they're not seeing the full picture um, or they're very, they think very badly about themselves because they don't think they're doing well enough compared to whoever they're watching on social media. Yeah. So how do you, how do you, as a parent and a grandparent, like, how do you have those conversations in your, in your family now? Like, you know, with, with the proliferation, like of, of social media. Everywhere? Well, you know, I think we're past the point, like when, when my kids were growing up, it was, we hadn't got to the point we're at now. So a lot of it was just limiting the time. You just limit the time, their exposure on it, get, make sure they're exposed to, to different things. That type of, it's not as easy now. And it hasn't even been that long, but it's it's not, you know, trying to just take social media away from a young person. That's not going to work. Yeah. You know, so you got to you got to find ways to to make sure that they're confident in themselves mm -hmm. and it's not coming from external things, you know, and that's not always easy. So a lot of it is just making sure that you're you're pointing out the good things. You're celebrating, you know, with them when when they have those little achievements because most of the time they don't. Yeah. So you can you can do it. It's it's just words of encouragement. It's having conversations like this just to make them aware that that situation is not unique. You know, everybody feels that way. Yeah. You know, at a certain time. So I, I I mean for for me as a parent now more as a grandparent because my kids are grown. Not that you ever stop, but but yeah. it's more for the the grandkids because they're they're four years and younger and they're already just wanting to be on a tablet or a phone or whatever. And so you have to have those conversations, you know, you, you, you have to limit uh, certain aspects of it, but you're not going to completely eliminate it. They're going to be exposed to it. I mean, they go to, to a daycare or a preschool 
and they're putting them on tablets. <laughs> yeah, don't get me started on that. <laughs> so a lot of it, I think, is just communication. Yeah. You know, you can't, you know, when, when I was growing up, it was a TV. You know, your parent would set you in front of a TV if they needed a break or whatever. Now we tend to hand a tablet or a phone or whatever it is. And that's okay in short doses, but you have to make sure you're having those conversations that keep them grounded, you know, so that they make sure they, they understand that those friends, you know, aren't necessarily the same as actual people. <laughs> we treat it like that because it's people on the other end of it, but we don't know them. We're only seeing a very small part of their lives. That's not quite the same thing as actually getting to know somebody. That's right. Yeah. yeah. And, and I, you know, I think that that's the, the opportunity in all areas of our life is to have more conversations to your point. Yeah. We're not going to be able to control, you know, we can no. make choices and we were not, not going to control the, the, the rapid, exponentially rapid um, growth of technology, but we can decide to have conversations, honest conversations, challenging conversations, yes. you know, whether it's in the family or in the workplace or in our communities about some of these things and how to stay connected to, to the human beings, you know, like, um, and to yeah. love or anything. Yeah, it really is. It really is. Well, Catherine, thanks for taking a little bit of time with me. I knew this was going to be a good conversation and it was, I could talk to you all day. You know, it's, uh, I, I, the, the mental health aspect for all of us, but especially in the workplace, I, I just think that's, that's really, uh, fascinating and it's going to be, become more and more important as we go along because you're going you've got people working remotely now that's a different challenge you've got people that got used to working remotely now going back into the workplace a lot of challenges uh, coming up but love talking with you the 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 song is love is not a game it's terrific and i know that that i um most of those uh proceeds are going to mental health charities i, I that's Terrific. Good for you for that. Yeah. To, to one in particular, the Unison Fund, which is a, a Canadian charity uh, focused on providing financial and mental health support to Canadian music industry professionals. Yeah. I love so, that. Yeah, yeah. Good. Good for you. That's, that's, that's so, uh, so terrific. So a couple of little things before I let you go. Um, anything else that you're working on that we can kind of keep an eye out for? Well, we, um, I've got some new tunes the kind of stuff we were working on at the same time, they'll be coming out over the next six months, but kind of a slow drip. There's nothing, nothing really blasty coming out. Um, this song will probably be part of an EP that we launch in the fall. Yeah. Um, and then a lot of work right now is uh, focused on actually developing some programming for mental health at work. Um, yeah. We actually just developed a program around substance use at work having oh, these yeah. honest conversations around substance yeah. use again in non-stigmatizing ways yeah um, very important because what happens at work often you know spills over into family and sure society does. as well um and just continuing to talk about like human-centered leadership practices like we talked about like being yeah. in you know uh, someone who's curious and reflective and and holding space for people to feel that what they do is really important and connected to the things and so, um, yeah, and we're continuing to do research, actually, um, ab about all of this stuff. So we're, we're not only finding research, we're doing some of our own research so that we'll be love able to, to share what we find, too. Yeah, I love that. So, okay, so last thing before we go, uh, where can we find you on social media? So uh, the Catherine Harrison, C-A-T-H-E-R-I-N-E, the Catherine Harrison on everything. I, I always love the the. <laughs> Probably, like if I could go back, I'd probably put it. <laughs> well, you know, that's not my idea. This is a young social media manager who said, you know, what you need. And I'm like, okay, I, what do I know? I don't know. That's right. Um, so it's that except every place except X, which is the Catherine H-A-R for some reason. Um, and uh, Revelios.com. That's the, that's our mental health company yeah. or CatherineHarrison.com. But if you type in Catherine Harrison, you're going to find all of those. It does. Things. It comes right up. Yeah. yeah. And I love to hear from people. Like, I love to hear, you know, what's working, what, what we could be doing to even, even if we can provide resources to them or help yeah. them build their own mental health toolkit. Uh, love to have, because that's basically a conversation just like we're having. I love that. 
I love that. Well, uh, Catherine, thank you so much. You have to come back. Maybe when, when you put the EP out, we can talk. I would love to. I would love to. That'd be great. Thank you so much for having me, Michael. It was a really great conversation. I enjoyed it. It was really good. Okay. Hold on one okay. second. The uh, talented Catherine Harrison. Hope you enjoyed that. I think what she's doing is really important workplace mental health. And I know she's dealing with mental health in a lot of different forms, but workplace mental health is something that um, we have to do better with. You know, we're, we're all struggling with the same type of things and we just need to do better with people. I think her work is so important and good for her for taking the proceeds from uh, Love is Not a Game and donating those to, um, to mental health uh, charities. I, I just think that's uh, terrific. And and she's, uh, Catherine is such a, a fascinating uh, person. Love talking to her. Um, the book we mentioned a few times, I don't think we ever said the name. It's it's a very long title, but worth the read. Uh, three Collars, 12 uh, Notes, and, and then it has uh, some more. But if you want to look it up, Three Collars, 12 Notes, um, Catherine Harrison. Thank you guys so much for tuning in uh, again with us uh, this week. We definitely don't take you for granted. Really appreciate that. I absolutely love talking uh, about uh, call centers and kind of working in that environment. I don't miss it. I didn't enjoy it when I was in it. I did it for 20 years. Um, and and the, the reason I say I, I didn't enjoy it is because once I had the podcast to compare it to, I could see what it was like to actually enjoy what you're doing compared to what I was doing. Definitely, definitely did not enjoy that time. A lot of that uh, is on me. I should have found a better way to um, to deal with that, uh, but didn't with that. And it's you know, there's a lot of uh, a lot of difficulties companies face um, just trying to be profitable, and unfortunately, some of those practices can lead to um, a negative effect on the employee's mental health. So just something that uh, I think is is worth uh, talking about. I, I always enjoyed um, telling you know th this story. I, I've been around call centers where you've got a, a badly performing team. You know, you just it's it's struggling for whatever reason. You put a new a uh, supervisor or manager, coach, whatever you want to call it, um, in charge. And that team improves to the point that they're the best performing team. So you'd think that that manager would be looked at in a certain way. Hey, that, that guy's doing a good job or that girl's doing a good job. And they are for a little while. But with companies, it's all about what have you done for me lately? So let's say that same team that was the worst, but is now the best, continues to perform at that level going forward, but they don't improve. Is that a good thing? Or is that a bad thing? Is that manager doing a good job because he took a team that's performing poorly, made them the best, uh, but then they kind of plateaued and they haven't improved, but they've maintained, maintained that level? Do we still look at that manager the same? Or do we look at it as, he's not doing a very good job? They're doing exactly what they did last year. I don't know, just something to think about because that was always something that caused me a lot of um, angst, you know, within uh, call centers because we'd see that uh, that type of situation all the time. But that can lead to stress. You know, if one day you're a top performer because you're on a, a, a top performing team, that's great. But then the next day you come in and you're getting questions like, well, you know, we haven't seen any improvement. Yeah, but I'm I'm still the best performer. Yeah, but you're not improving. So I don't know. Just just something that was kind of weighing on my mind while we were talking. It's just an example of a situation that uh, that I've seen happen that can definitely have negative effects on employees, and they're not doing anything wrong. So I don't know. Got off on a tangent. Thank you for listening. Um, our website is MeisterCon.com. We've got about 750 episodes that you can listen or watch on there. Um, our YouTube channel is MeisterCon Pod. Please subscribe. That really helps us out. Thank you guys for listening or watching. Appreciate you. Till next time. Bye, everybody. 
Hi, everybody. I'm once again here to ask for your support. It's been a big year for the Two Opinionated podcast. Back in February, we got to live out a dream, moderate for William Shatner here in our hometown. In May, we passed 100,000 downloads on our YouTube channel, and we followed that up in June with 50,000 downloads on the audio side. We recently posted our 600th episode, which is pretty good volume for just a uh, father and son operation. You know, not too many podcasts can keep that volume up. We've been doing this now for four and a half years, 600 plus episodes. We recently hit 1,000 subscribers on our YouTube channel, which is a really big deal for us because we've always gotten the views, but have struggled to get people to subscribe. So that 1,000 was a big deal for us. And best of all, we were recently named one of the top podcasts on IMDb, which is the entertainment database. You know, those that are ahead of us, we came in at number 82. Those that are ahead of us are bigger companies like Disney, mostly Marvel, and Joe Rogan, that type of uh, podcast. So for us, being just a, a small West Virginia father and son podcast, to be in the top 100 out of 15 million, it's a pretty big deal for us. So thank you for everything you've done for us so far. Got a couple little ways, though, that you can help us, and they're free, and they're really easy. If you haven't checked out our YouTube channel yet, please go to YouTube. It's under MeisterCon Pod. Just hit subscribe. It's free. It doesn't cost you anything. really helps us a ton. And maybe even more important, if you could go to IMDB, IMDB.com, look up the Two Opinionated Podcast, and just look around the page. Just having that traffic on the page really helps us out. So that's a couple of easy ways that you can support us, even if you're not listening or watching all of the time. And we want you to listen and watch, because I think that our... Our guest list, I would put up against anybody, any other show, podcast, anybody out there. I think our guest list holds up. So please check us out. You you probably will find somebody that you like or maybe somebody that you didn't know you liked but kind of discovered them on there. There's tons of that. If you're into music, we have that too. If you like books, we've got authors on there. If you if you're more into what goes on behind the scenes in the entertainment world, you know, we've got producers, directors, um, video artists, anything you can think of that happens behind the scenes, we've had them on the show. So definitely check us out. Thank you guys so, so much. Until next time. Bye everybody.